السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. We begin as we begin all of our talks by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is worthy of being praised and by asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to the straight path and we seek Allah's refuge from the evil of our souls and the consequences of our actions. Indeed, whomever Allah guides, no one can ever misguide him. And whomever Allah azza wa jal chooses to misguide, no one can guide him back to the straight path. Indeed, I bear witness and I testify a, t- a testification of certainty, of yaqeen, that there is no object, no being, no deity, no God that is worthy of our worship, our veneration, our love, our hope, our prostration, our dua, our sajda, other than Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. And I bear witness and I testify that Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Hashimi al-Arabi al-Qurashi is the final prophet and the most perfect messenger that ever walked on the face of this earth. As to what follows, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, verily, Allah Azza wa Jal is the best of all planners. And it is indeed ironic that I stand in front of you today, after having recorded two weeks ago, just two weeks ago, in a city far, far away, a short brief message telling you to come to this conference, but also excusing myself and saying, unfortunately, I will not be able to make it this year for for reasons that are very complicated. I've just come from another conference in America, the largest conference there, and I said I cannot make it to this conference. Yet Allah Azza wa Jal had willed that I would be standing in front of you today. And even though it was not my plan, not because I didn't want to be here, but because of logistical factors, Allah Azza wa Jal had something planned. And indeed the plan of Allah is always best. So I am humbled and I am proud and I am very, very, very honored to stand in front of you today to participate in the greatest and the grandest and the most magnificent conference that this country, inshaAllah ta'ala, has ever seen. Now the talk that I have today is about etiquettes of conversing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do we engage in a conversation, in an appeal? How do we ask Allah and beseech Him for what we want? And I thought that instead of listing for you a bunch of points, why not take one of the most important stories in the Qur'an and analyze this story in light of the etiquettes of beseeching Allah. And the story that I'm going to mention and discuss in detail is the story that touches all of us here because it talks about the beginning of creation. It is the story of the Genesis itself. It is the story of how mankind came on earth. It is the story of creation. It is the story of Adam alayhi salam and Iblis and what Iblis did to our father Adam. In light of this story, in light of the story of Adam alayhi salam and what the arch enemy of mankind Iblis did to him, and in light of their responses and reactions, let us see what we can benefit and how we can gain in learning how best to have a conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What do we learn of the etiquettes of dua in the story of the creation? First and foremost, before even Adam opened his mouth, before even Adam said anything, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed Adam with everything that he could ever imagine. Allah azza wa jal gave Adam Jannah and everything in Jannah. Allah azza wa jal gave Adam his wife Hawa. Allah azza wa jal gave him the best clothing and the best garment and the best food and the best place and the best lodging. Without even Adam raising his hands to Allah and saying, Oh Allah, give me this. And this shows us Many Muslims wonder, why is it that Allah provides for people who don't even ask Him? Why is it that Allah takes care of those who even are so arrogant that they reject His existence? And in the story of Adam, we learn, Allah is Ar-Rahim. 
Allah is Al-Wadud, Allah is Al-Rahman, Allah is Al-Kareem, Allah is Al-Mannan, Allah is the ever-loving, the ever-merciful, the ever-generous. He is the Lord and the Rabb. He will take care of you because He created you. He will take care of you because He is your Lord. Without even you asking Him, there is an element of taking care. There is an element of nourishment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant even if you do not ask Him that. And we see this in the story of Adam alayhi salam. Without even doing anything, Allah told Adam, وَقُلْنَا يَا آدَمُ اسْكُنْ أَنْتَ وَزَوْجُكَ الْجَنَّةِ We said, O oh Adam, you and your wife, you live in Jannah. وَكُلَا مِنْهَا رَغَدًا حَيْثُ شِئْتُمَا And you eat bountifully. You eat whatever you want. Ragada means the most luxurious fruits, the most luxurious meats. Eat as much as you want. So Allah Azza wa Jal blessed this to Adam without even Adam making dua. And that is because as we said, Allah is the Rabb. And the meaning of Rabb, many of us don't even understand what does it mean Rabb. The meaning of Rabb is the one who will nourish and take care of me. From Tarbiya. Tarbiya, right? The same root. The meaning of Rabb, he shall nourish, he shall envelope me in his mercy. And Allah is the Rabb of the Muslim and the non-Muslim. Allah is the Rabb of the creation. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil. What Muslim mean? Rabbil Mu'mineen? No. Rabbil Alameen. Allah is the Rabb of the entire creation. Therefore, He shall take care of the creation, even if the creation is too arrogant to acknowledge Him or to worship Him. The story goes on of Adam and Iblis. And we know that Adam was told something. And Iblis was told something. And we know that the, both of them disobeyed what they were told. Adam was told not to eat of the fruit. Iblis was told to prostrate. Adam was misguided and deceived by Iblis and he ate from that fruit. And Iblis was told to prostrate and he refused to prostrate. So the both of them, in one sense, they fell into an error. But what was the response of both of these individuals? Was it the same? What was the prophetic response of Adam? And what was the satanic response of Iblis? Adam, when he ate of the tree, he realized that I have done a mistake. And so he said, رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا Oh my Lord, I have wronged myself. I've sinned. He made a dua. And this is an essential dua. We're going to come back to it over and over again. رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا Oh my Lord, I have wronged myself. It's my fault. وَإِلَّمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا If you don't have mercy on us, if you don't forgive us, لَنَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ We have no hope. There is no other hope. We shall be of the losers. There is nothing else on earth that can save us other than you, O Allah Azza wa Jal. If you don't help us, forgive us, save us, nothing can save us. This was the response of Adam alayhi salam. What was the response of Iblis? Iblis alayhi la'natullah. When he did the sin that he did, when he refused to prostrate, he didn't recognize a sin. He didn't say, oh Allah, I made a mistake. Rather, in his sheer arrogance, he accused Allah of the crime. And he said, قَالَ رَبِّ بِمَا أَغْوَيْتَنِي He said, Oh my Rabb, because you have misguided me. You have misled me. You have betrayed me. أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ Compare the two responses. Adam says, I've made a mistake, O oh Allah, forgive me. Iblis says, it's all your fault, O oh Allah, you did it. You were the one who forced me to do this. Notice the response. This shows us the difference between Iman and Kufr. The difference between servitude to Allah and arrogance in rejecting that servitude. On the one hand, the worshipping of Allah and the making dua to Allah. And on the other hand, the arrogance, the refusal to make dua. And that is why of the signs of faith is that that person must make dua to Allah. And of the signs of a lack of faith is that person will refuse to make dua. Like Iblis. Of the signs of faith, we learn from the story of Adam, of the signs of Iman, it is a part of Iman to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is a sign of arrogance and kufr to reject that dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Allah Azza wa says in the Quran, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Your Lord has said, make dua to me. 
I shall respond to you. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ عَنْ عِبَادَتِي سَيَدْخُلُونَ جَهَنَّمَ دَاخِرِينَ Those who are too arrogant to worship me. Notice, your Lord has said, make dua. To me, I shall respond. If you're too arrogant to make dua, these are the ones upon whom the punishment will come. There's two categories. You either make dua or you're too arrogant to make dua. Adam was of the first category. He made dua. Iblis was of the second category. He refused to make dua. Making dua is a sign of iman. Making dua is a part and parcel of believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is because when you have faith in Allah, you recognize who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. When you have faith in Allah, you affirm Allah cares about me. Allah loves me. Allah hears my prayer. And Allah is capable of responding to my prayer. Therefore, when you believe in an all-loving, all-powerful, all-merciful God, you must raise your hands to that God. And you must say, Oh Allah, give me this. Oh Allah, prevent me from that. Oh Allah, guide me. Oh Allah, this. Oh Allah, that. Because you believe in Allah. And when you do not have that faith, when you are too arrogant to acknowledge Allah, when you're too arrogant to affirm His beautiful names and attributes, that is when you will become, A'udhu Billah, following the sunnah of Iblis by rejecting this type of dua. Making dua to Allah is a perfection of worshipping Him. The essence of worshipping Allah is dua. The Prophet ﷺ said, Dua is the essence of worship, the gist of worship, the crux of worship, the backbone of worship. If you don't have dua, you don't have worship. There is no worship if you don't have dua. That is because, imagine somebody making dua to Allah. Imagine what is going in his mind when he makes this dua. When you pray to that being, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you affirm, you acknowledge, this is the being that cares about me. This is the being that hears my prayer. This is the being that shall grant me what I want. This is my all-powerful Rabb who will take care of and nourish me. It goes hand in hand, Iman and Dua, Ibadah and Dua. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those who make Dua. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Verily the most noble act of worship is Dua. And he also said, the one who does not ask Allah, Allah gets angry at him. If you don't ask Allah, Allah gets angry. Who are you not to ask Allah? Allah loves those who ask, because this is what we as human beings must do. So this is another benefit from the story of Adam and the creation. The third benefit that we derive from this story, is that we see that there are different types of dua. There is a dua that is of a noble nature, asking spirituality, asking forgiveness, asking hidayah. And then there are duas of this world. You want money, you want wealth, you want status, you want a fancy car, you want etc, etc. Of the signs of the believer, is that he asks for both types, but he prioritizes the spiritual dua. And of the signs of a person of weak faith, of low faith. He doesn't care about the spiritual dua. He just wants the worldly matters. He just wants things of this world. How do we learn this from the story of Adam and Iblis? Look at what Adam asked for. Adam alayhi salam, he understands he's committed a sin. And so he says, Oh my Lord, forgive me, have mercy on me. What's on his mind is forgiveness and mercy, guidance, spiritual nourishment from Allah. Iblis, he didn't care about that. What was the request of Iblis? Iblis said, Qala anzirni ila Give me life. I want to live until the day of judgment. He's greedy for this world. He doesn't care about the hereafter. He's greedy for this dunya. That's not the way of the believer. The way of the believer is, that he prioritizes the akhirah and he also asks of this world. And Allah mentions this in the Quran. Allah says in the Quran, فَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا وَمَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَاقِ There are those who say, give me of this world, O oh Allah. Give me money, give me status, give me power, give me fame, give me this, give me that. But they do not ask Allah for guidance. They do not ask Allah for mercy. They do not ask Allah for forgiveness. 
So Allah says, these people, because they were greedy for this world, they might even get it, but they won't get the hereafter. وَمِنْهُمْ And there's also a group of people, they say, رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَا وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ there are those who say, Oh Allah, give us good in this world, but also give us good in the hereafter, and save us from the fire of hell. Emphasis is on the hereafter. أُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمْ نَصِيبٌ مِّمَّا كَثَبُ وَاللَّهُ سَرِيُّ الْحِسَابِ These are the ones, they shall get a share of Allah's mercy. And Allah is swift in reckoning. So brothers and sisters, the third point that we benefit from this story, if you find yourself only making dua about this world, then there's a problem. If you find yourself asking Allah for good grades, for a good spouse, for good world, for a good job, for a good car, for good this, for good that, and you're not asking Allah for guidance, you're not asking Allah for Jannah, you're not asking Allah for Iman, for Taqwa, for forgiveness, ask yourself, who are you imitating more? Which of these two characters are you closer to? The mu'min wants this world, yes. But he is more desirous, more greedy for the akhirah. So he makes dua for this world, but the emphasis and concentration is on the akhirah. And this is of the benefits of the story. Another benefit of the story, another benefit of the story is that Iblis was forced to turn to Allah when he needed Allah. And he refused to worship Him when he thought he didn't need Him. Whereas Adam continued worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even after this incident. And this shows us that of the prophetic methodology is that you are consistent in your dua and your worship. When Adam came down to this earth, he didn't stop worshipping Allah. He continued worshipping, he continued praying, he continued making dua. Iblis only turned to Allah for a worldly matter that he really, really needed. He said, oh, he said, قَالَ أَنظِرْنِي إِلَى يَوْمِ يُبْعَثُونَ He said, allow me to live until the day of judgment. He needed this and he knew Allah could give it to him. So he begged and pleaded for that which he needed, even though he was too arrogant to do sajda just a little while ago. Just a little while ago, he couldn't prostrate. It's too arrogant. But now he needs Allah. So he turns to Allah, oh Allah, give me this. And once Allah gives him that, that's it for all of eternity. Iblis has turned his back away from spirituality. Therefore, anyone who turns to Allah only at times of distress and neglects Allah for the rest of the time, that's a problem. If you find yourself making dua when your son is sick, but you don't make dua when everything is fine and dandy in your life, that's a problem. The mu'min always, ever, is involved in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as we said, continuous dua is a sign of iman. The mu'min asks and asks and asks because the mu'min always realizes he is in need of Allah. But the one of little faith or the one of no faith, such a person only turns to Allah when he thinks or she thinks they need Allah. Even though they need Allah all the time, but they don't notice that. They don't realize that. And that is why Allah says in the Qur'an in over a dozen verses, over a dozen verses, Allah describes the state of mankind. وَإِذَا مَسَّ الْإِنسَانَ الضُّرْ When mankind is touched with an affliction, a little pin pricks you. دَعَانَا He makes dua to us. قَاعِدًا أو قَائِمًا أو قَاعِدًا Standing, sitting or lying down. Always saying, Oh Allah, save me. Oh Allah, please cure me of this cancer. Oh Allah, cure my son of this. Oh Allah, make me pass the exam. Oh Allah, give me a job. I don't have a job. Oh Allah, do this, do that. And then Allah says, As soon as I give him what, I want, what he wants, as soon as I respond to his prayer, they turn away. To turn to Allah only during times of need, even Iblis did that. That's not a sign of faith. That's not a sign of iman. That's not a sign of spirituality. To turn to Allah continuously, frequently, persistently, to always be engaged in worship, this is the true sign of, Allah, of having Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your heart and in your life. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said in an authentic hadith, whoever wishes, listen to this, listen to this beautiful hadith, whoever wishes that Allah responds to his dua at times of hardship, at times of difficulty, 
then let him increase his dua at times of ease. This is a hadith in Tirmidhi. Whoever wishes that Allah responds to your dua when you really need it, then you must increase your dua at times of ease. Why is this? Very simple. I'll give you an analogy that all of us understand. A friend of yours always contacts you, is in touch with you, visits you, cares about you. And then he calls you up and he goes, Akhi, I'm, I'm really in a bad situation. I need a loan. Can you help me out? Will you be more willing to help this friend compared to somebody you never see? You only see him at Eid or something. And then he calls you out of the blue and he goes, I'm in a bad situation. Can you give me a loan? Which of the two are you automatically more inclined towards? Walillahi al a'la. To Allah belongs the better and the most perfect example. But this is an analogy we understand. Somebody who has a continual relationship with you, it shows that this person has a genuine concern and care and love for you. Somebody who's always making dua to Allah, always praying, always fasting, always has a conversation with Allah. Don't you think when he needs Allah, Allah Azza wa Jal will give him what he wants? Versus the one who ignores Allah 24-7, has nothing to do with the religion. And then when he falls sick in bed, Oh God, help me. Oh God, save me. Which of the two do you think has a better chance of getting a response? Therefore, as the Arabic saying goes, whoever continually knocks on the door, eventually is let in. If you continually knock on Allah's door, eventually you will be let in. So persistence, persistence, persistence. Of the benefits of the story, of the benefits of the story, is that both Adam and Iblis, Adam the leader of the prophets of his time, the father of all of humanity, and Iblis the leader of evil, they both realized that Allah Azza wa Jal and only Allah could give them what they desired. Even though they desired very different things, even Iblis realized only Allah can give me what I want. Despite his evil nature, despite the, the filth that he was upon, when he really needed something, he had to turn to Allah. He realized nobody else could possibly give him what he wants. Now, if even Iblis understands this, is it not strange to find many groups of people, some who even call themselves Muslims, who think that other than Allah can give them what they want? Is it not amazing? That people, some of whom call themselves Muslim, of course there are many of other religions and faiths who pray to other than Allah. But unfortunately, we even have some who call themselves Muslims, but they turn to other than Allah. They turn to a dead saint. They turn to a sheikh. They turn to a peer. They turn to this, they turn to that. Even Iblis realized only Allah can give him what he wants. Forget Adam and the prophets, of course they know this. But even Iblis, when he really, really, really wanted something, he didn't say, Ya Ghoth al-A'zam, Ya Ali, Ya Fulan, Ya Allan. He didn't say this. He said, Oh my Lord, let me live till the day of judgment. I find it amazing that a Muslim says, La ilaha illallah, which translates as, There is no deity worthy of worship other than Allah. And dua is the essence of worship. And yet he still goes to the grave of a saint. And he says, Ya Ghoth al-A'zam, Ya Ali, Ya Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, Ya Fulan, Ya Allan, Give me this and give me that. Where is our iman and taqwa? Where is our understanding of la ilaha illallah? Anybody who turns to other than Allah for dua has not understood the meaning of la ilaha illallah. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, you know there are over 500 verses in the Quran. And I'm not exaggerating. Over 500 verses where Allah prohibits making dua to other than Him. Explicitly. Of these verses, وَمَنْ أَضَلُّ مِمَّنْ يَدْعُ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ مَنْ لَا يَسْتَجِبُ لَهُ إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ Who is more foolish and misguided? Not even Iblis fell into this. That's why Allah is saying this. Who is more foolish and misguided than someone who makes dua to other than Allah? To a creature and a being that will not even respond to him until the end of times. Who can be more foolish than this? Allah says in the Quran, إِن تَدْعُوهُمْ Listen to this ayah. إِن تَدْعُوهُمْ لَا يَسْمَعُوا دُعَاءَكُمْ If you make dua to these dead people, they can't even hear your dua. وَلَوْ سَمِعُوا Even if they could hear, they could not give you what you want. مَسْتَجَابُوا لَكُمْ 
They wouldn't have the power. Even if they could hear you, they wouldn't have the power to give you what you want. On top of that, وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يَكْفُرُونَ بِشِرْكِكُمْ And on the day of judgment, this is a beautiful verse, they will do kufr of your shirk. يَكْفُرُونَ بِشِرْكِكُمْ They will dissociate from your shirk. And when you look at the tafsir of this ayah, when you look at what this ayah means, the scholars of tafsir, they say, this ayah is a reference to those spiritually guided, righteous human beings who were worshipped besides Allah and they never called for that worship. For example, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, Isa ibn Maryam, a noble prophet, one of the greatest human beings to walk on the face of this earth. One of the five mightiest messengers whom Allah sent. Someone whom Allah gave miracles, the like of which He gave no other prophet. Did Jesus Christ ever tell His followers to worship Him? Did this noble prophet, did this worshiper of Allah ever tell mankind, take me as a God besides God? Worship me, ask me of anything? Not once did He do so. Not once. And yet what do many Christians of our times do? Oh Jesus, save me. Oh Jesus, grant me salvation. Oh Jesus, oh Jesus. Jesus Christ, Isa ibn Maryam, only told us to worship God. Only told us to be sincere to God. And yet his followers elevated him. His followers took him to a level he himself never wanted. And so Allah says in the Quran about Jesus Christ and about people such as the righteous saints. Abd al-Qadir al-Jilani is an author, a scholar, an academic, an imam, an alim. You read his books, they're still in print. It is nothing but Quran and Sunnah. Abd al-Qadir al-Jilani is a great imam, Zahid. He never told the people to worship him. And yet, what do we have now? We have millions of Muslims. Ya Abdul Qadir al Jilani, Ya Fulan, Ya Allah. These people were righteous Imams. They never told the human beings to raise them to gods, just like Jesus Christ. So Allah says, in reference to these people, if you make dua to Jesus Christ, to Abdul Qadir al Jilani, to Chishti, to this, to that, they will not even hear your dua. And even if God gave them the power to hear, they wouldn't have the power to give you what you want. And to top it all off, on the day of judgment they will come and they will say, and we know this from other verses in the Qur'an, Surah Al-Ma'idah, Allah says in the Qur'an, I will ask Jesus Christ, أَأَنْتَ قُلْتَ لِلنَّاسِ اتَّخِذُونِي وَأُمِّيَ إِلَهِنِي مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ God says, Allah says, I will ask Jesus Christ, did you tell people, did you command your followers to worship you, to worship your mother besides God? And Jesus Christ will respond, Subhanak, exalted be you. I never said to them anything other than what you told me to tell them. I never increased the message. I only said, worship God, my Lord and your Lord. God is my Lord. Allah is my Lord and your Lord. That's all I told them. So on the day of judgment, Jesus Christ will tell Christians, I didn't tell you to make me a God or a son of God. Abdul Qadir al Jilani and all the righteous people, insha'Allah, if they were truly righteous and it looks like they were truly righteous, they too will come and they will tell. On the day of judgment, I didn't tell anybody to worship me. I didn't tell people to build mausoleums and huge structures around my grave and do tawaf around it and make dua to it. I didn't do this. The people did it. So we learn from this story. Even Iblis understands this. And who is more misguided than somebody who falls into something that Iblis himself did not fall into? Of the benefits of this story, of the benefits of this story is that both Adam and Iblis, they asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something very great and very grand. Adam was only told to not do one thing. He had the entire fruits of Jannah. He had an infinite amount of land and luxuries and sweets and meats and everything. Just one tree, stay away from it. Yet, Iblis seduced him and Iblis misguided him and he ate from that one tree. And he begged Allah for forgiveness. After this one commandment he had, that he broke, he begged Allah for forgiveness. Iblis asked Allah for the longest life that anyone that we know has ever had. Any creature, no human being as far as we know, and no jinn has been given the length of life that this one individual, Iblis, this one Satan, the leader of Satan's, Iblis or Lucifer as the Christians call him, this one individual has been given a longer life than any other human being as far as we know and any other jinn. 
Both of them are asking Allah for something magnificent and great. And this shows us that the both of them understood and realized Allah Azza wa Jal is capable of all things. Allah can give you everything you want. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, when one of you asks, realize that he's asking from a Lord who's generous and he gives. So increase your du'as, increase your asking, increase asking Allah for whatever you want. The Sahaba, the companions, they said, if that is the case, then we're gonna ask for a lot of things. If you want us to ask for many things, we're gonna ask, we're gonna nukthir, we're gonna do akthar. And the Prophet ﷺ smiled and he said, Allahu akthar. Allah is even more than all you can ask for. Allah is more than all you can ask for. Each and every desire that you have that is religiously pure, even if it is of this world, each and every desire that you have that is a permissible desire, you should ask it of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Aisha, the beloved wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, when your lace, when your shoelace breaks, when your shoelace breaks, make sure you make dua to Allah to give you another lace. Because if Allah has not willed that you get another lace, you're never gonna get it. This is what Aisha said, don't trivialize anything. If your shoelace breaks, make dua to Allah. And Allah is more than anything you can ask for. Increase your quantity, your quality, your frequency of dua. Because you are asking Al-Kareem, the ever generous. You're asking Al-Mannan, the one who gives and gives and does not count. And you're asking the one, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah Azza wa Jal is hayy, he is shy and modest. That when his servants raise his hand up to him, when the servant raises the hand up to Allah, Allah is too modest to allow those hands to come back down empty. Something is going to be in those hands. Allah is hayy. You know when we're walking in the street and a beggar comes, a lady comes with a child, please give me something, please give me something. Even if we don't give, don't we feel a bit bad? Don't we feel a bit guilty? It's human nature, right? Allah made us merciful. How about the one who is merciful? How about Ar-Rahman himself? When we raise our hands to Allah and beg of Him and plead of Him and ask Him, Oh God, Oh Allah, give me this, give me that. The Prophet ﷺ said, Never does a Muslim raise his hand up to Allah except that by the time those hands come down, there's something in them. Allah will bless us with something. And this is of the nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the ever generous, the ever merciful, the ever loving, the ever giving. Of the benefits of this story, a follow up at this point as well, but more explicitly. Of the benefits of this story, and this is a very, very profound benefit. Both Adam and Iblis got what they asked for. Even the dua of Iblis was accepted. I want you to think about that. Even the dua of Iblis was accepted. Why? Because Allah is the Lord of all of the creation. And Iblis is of the creation. Never ever despair of the mercy of Allah. Never ever give hope of having your dua answered. Never ever presume that, oh, I'm too sinful for having my dua answered. The Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith in Tirmidhi, there is no person who asks Allah for anything that is permissible, except that Allah gives him something in return. Either He gives him what he wants, or he prevents an evil coming from him, or he blesses him with a reward in the hereafter. Something happens to you. In other words, no dua do you make, except that there is some type of response. And by the way, this explains why many of the time, we think our dua has not been answered, but in fact it has already been answered. Allah Azza wa Jal gives us something better than what we ask for because Allah knows what we're asking for is not in our best interest. Suppose we want a job, suppose we want a status, suppose we want a degree, suppose we want a rank, we want something. And we pray and we pray and we pray and we pray and we don't get it. Don't give up and say, oh, Allah didn't give it to me. How do you know Allah didn't give you something better because of that dua? something more useful for you, something more conducive to your nature, something that will bring about better blessings for you in this world and the next. Don't you trust Allah that Allah knows what is best for you? And you know what? I challenge all of you sitting here now to think about your life, 
to think about your moments of crises, to think about the things that you desired and were not given to you at that time. And you were disappointed and depressed. Every one of you eventually did you not see the fruits and the blessings of that decision that Allah had decided? Did you not realize that whatever Allah had decided for me was the best? I wouldn't be who I am today. I wouldn't be who I am today if I had a different course. If Allah Azawajal had not tested and tried me in that manner. If He had not deprived me from this and from that. And I stand before you today and I say, Yes, Wallahi, Wallahi, I swear by Allah, many are the things that I desired. Many are the things I made dua for, and dua for, and dua for, and dua for. And they weren't given to me. And in retrospect, each and every one of those things was a blessing in disguise. Each and every way that Allah took me was a way that would lead me to where I am. And I have full trust in Allah that whatever happens, happens by the decree of Allah and Allah knows what is best for me better than what I know. So put your trust in Allah and realize that everything that happens, happens for a wisdom. And remember, remember, if even the dua of Iblis was answered, do you think you're more sinful than Satan himself, than shaitan? Do you think you're worse than shaitan? Shaitan had his dua answered. Allah gave it to him. Allah said, okay, fine, live till the day of judgment. Allah gave him what he wanted. You're not worse than Iblis. You're not worse than shaitan. If even shaitan got his dua answered, surely me and you have more of a right of having our dua answered. Also of the lessons that we learn in this, uh, in this incident, there are many etiquettes that we learn of dua. And this is a topic in and of itself, the etiquettes of dua. There are many etiquettes that we learn of how to properly make dua. And of these etiquettes is the realization that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to the dua. Sincerity in dua. This is of the primary etiquettes of dua. Being sincere to Allah. And realizing only Allah can give me what I want. And we learn this in many, many incidents as well. Look at the story of Yunus alayhi salam, the Prophet Jonah, when the whale swallowed him up and he was in darkness upon darkness upon darkness. He called out to Allah in the darkness, Oh Allah, save me, I made a mistake. And he had full certainty only in Allah that Allah could give him what he wanted. And indeed, Allah gave him what he wanted. Have that certainty and sincerity to Allah. Of the etiquettes of dua that we make, that we learn from this incident, is the presence of an attentive heart. The presence of an attentive heart. You must concentrate on your dua. Don't parrot duas. Don't just pick up a prayer book and repeat those things like a parrot. Understand what they are and say it with humility. Say it beseeching Allah earnestly, meaning what you say desiring what the dua is asking for, and not just repeating it with your tongue. And this is something that is clearly shown, the desperation and the humility of Adam alayhi salam is clearly shown. رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا Oh my Lord, I have wronged myself, I've done a sin. We hear the plea, we hear the cry of desperation. I've done a wrong, O oh Allah. And if you don't forgive me, if you don't have mercy on me, there is no hope for me. There is no other source of hope other than you, O oh Allah. لَنَكُنَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ This is begging and pleading. This is beseeching. This is crying in earnest for Allah Azza wa Jal to give you what you want. This is of the primary etiquettes of dua. Contrast this to Iblis. Compare this to Iblis. Let me live till the day of judgment. Contrast the two du'as. In the one we hear a plea. In the one we hear that begging, that desperation. Oh Allah, I need you. Oh Allah, give me what I need. If you don't, nobody else can give me. And on the other hand, we have nothing but arrogance. Give me life till the day of judgment. We notice as well, Adam alayhi salam beseeches Allah with his names and attributes. Rabbana, Rabbana ظلمنا أنفسنا. And of the strongest etiquettes of dua, you use Allah's names and attributes. You use Allah's names and attributes in your dua. Iblis on the other hand, he says, as is mentioned in Surah Al-A'raf, Let me live till the day of judgment. Not even in this verse, not even Rabbi. In another verse it is mentioned, in this verse it is absent. The same surah that tells us Adam's dua, Rabbana ظلمنا أنفسنا. The same surah, when it mentions Iblis's dua, there is no Rabb. Let me live till the day of judgment. Notice the two. Of the strongest etiquettes of dua, 
of the strongest ways of guaranteeing your dua is accepted. You use Allah's beautiful names and majestic attributes. O oh, you full of mercy, O oh, loving God, Wadud, O oh, Rahman, O oh, Rahim, O oh, Kareem, O oh, ever generous, O oh, Sami Ad Dua, the one who can hear me, O oh, the one who knows what is in my heart. You beseech Allah with His perfect names and majestic attributes. And that is exactly why Allah has told us of His names in the Quran. Walillahil Asma'ul Husna, Fadu'uhu Biha. To Allah belongs the most beautiful names. So make dua to Him using those names. Fadu'uhu. We make dua to Allah using the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of the etiquettes of dua, of the etiquettes of dua is that we make dua having an optimistic mind as well. Even though we're scared of a response, we want the reward. We want the response as well. Fear and hope go hand in hand. We're scared of a rejection, but we hope for acceptance. And this is exactly what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said when he said, when you make dua to Allah, be certain in your hearts that Allah will give you what you want. Don't be pessimistic. Don't have this attitude of, Oh, I don't think Allah will give me what I want. That's wrong. Allah will give you what you want if you are sincere to Him. Allah will give you what you want, or maybe He'll give you something better than what you want. If you are sincere to Him. Allah. this is a hadith. Make dua to Allah. وَأَنْتُمْ مُوْقِنُونَ بِالْعِجَابَةِ And you are sure that Allah will respond to you. Your state of mind should be optimism. The Prophet ﷺ said that Allah says, أَنَا عِنْدَ ظَنِّ عَبْدِي بِي I will be as my servant thinks I am to him. If he thinks good thoughts of me, I will treat him nicely. And if he thinks me to be miserly and stingy, then I will be miserly and stingy. I am as my servant thinks of me. If you have positive thoughts of Allah, if you think that Allah will give you what you want, does care about you, does love you, that is the way Allah will treat you. But if you are so arrogant and cheap as to say, oh, Allah can never forgive me, well, why should Allah forgive you if that's your attitude? You show sincerity. Like the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever comes one hand's band to Allah, Allah comes an arm's length to him. Whoever comes to Allah walking, Allah comes to him running. In other words, when you make an effort, Allah doubles, triples, quadruples the effort. You need to show the effort to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of the etiquettes of dua, of the etiquettes of dua is acknowledging your sins. Acknowledging your sins. Acknowledging that despite all that Allah has given me and you, despite all these blessings of health and wealth and food and peace and security, despite each and every blessing that even if we tried to count them, we could not list them, we have fallen short in our duties to Allah. We have not been good servants of Allah. We have not been true servants and Muslims. Our sins are too numerous. And this is exactly what Adam alayhi salam said, Rabbana ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا Oh our Lord, we have wronged ourselves. That's how you begin dua. Oh Allah, I know I'm not the best Muslim. Oh Allah, I know that I have fallen short. Oh Allah, I know I am at fault. And yet I still turn to you because there is no other being out there I can turn to. There is no other God besides you. There is no other Lord, no other ever merciful, ever caring, loving God other than you. You acknowledge your sins. Rabbana ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا Oh our Lord, we have done wrong. And then you turn to Allah begging and pleading your state. Oh Muslims, there is much to talk about and time is of the essence and we need to wrap up. And we can conclude by stating that dua is the heart of worship and its foundation. Beseeching Allah, having a conversation with Allah, it is a sign of a love of Allah. Wallahi, it is a sign of a love of Allah. When you love somebody, you remain in touch with them. When you love somebody, you call them up all the time. I travel frequently, and every single day I have to call my kids up. I have to be in touch with them wherever I am, because I love them. And I ask them the silliest questions, what did you eat for breakfast? Who cares what they ate for breakfast? But this is a sign of love, isn't it? Right? I love my kids, I have to talk to them. I love my wife, I call her up. That's a sign of love. So when you love a being, you are always in communication with that being. If you truly love Allah, you will worship Allah. If you truly love Allah, you will always be making dua to Allah, asking Him, beseeching Him, begging Him, pleading Him. This is your conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Never ever give up hope of Allah's mercy. Do not be in distress. Do not be, op do not be pessimistic. The believer is always optimistic. O Muslim, realize 
that our honor lies in humbling ourselves before the one who has honor, and that is Al Aziz. Our honor lies in humbling ourselves before Al Aziz, and our strength lies in admitting our complete weakness in front of Al Qawi. This is how we become strong by acknowledging that the only true Al Qawi is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I conclude this talk by giving a very beautiful statement and piece of advice that one of the famous scholars of the past said, Ibrahim. Ibn Adham, he was asked by his students, he was asked by his students, why is it that Allah doesn't answer our prayers? We've been praying for a long time, why doesn't He answer our prayers? And so Ibrahim Ibn Adham said, it is because you know Allah, but you don't obey Him. And you know the Prophet, but you don't follow His Sunnah. And you know the Quran, but you don't act upon it. And you eat from the blessings of Allah, but you are not thankful for those blessings. And you know paradise, but you're not striving to get to it. And you know the fire of hell, but you're not running away from it. And you know shaitan, but you don't fight him. And you know death, but you do not prepare for it. Brothers and sisters, Allah says in the Quran, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ When my servant asks you about me, tell him, I am ever close. I shall respond to the call of the one who calls out to me. Let them call out to me. And let them believe in me. So that they may be rightly guided. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the iman and the tawfiq and the amal to believe in Him the way that He deserves to be believed Him and to worship Him the way that He deserves to be worshipped and to make dua to Him the way that He deserves dua to be made to Him. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا أَنَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَصَلَّى اللَّهُ وَسَلَّمُ وَبَارَكَ عَلَى عَدِي مُحَمَّدٍ وآله وصحبه أجمعين